Father, thank you that we can be here this morning. And Jesus, I just want to thank you for your grace. The grace you have on my life and everyone here. For, um, to the, um, to the price that you've paid for us so that we can be free, renewed, raised and established in your will and your plan for our lives. Father, and I pray that as your, as, as your word is being shared this morning, Holy Spirit, may you open our hearts and our minds for what you want to come and do in our lives. And may we be changed by your glory, by your anointing, and may we walk out here on fire and to change for you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And so the title of the sermon is The Lord's Favor. But the more uh, appropriate uh, the title would be The Year of the Lord's Favor. Even more, The Year of Jubilee, but then we get into some other, other things. So I, I just went with The Lord's Favor. Simply because when we accept Jesus, we are living in the favor that God has on our lives to have a blessed life, have a life free of what is holding us back, a life where not only does God call us, but He equips us and He says, you are worthy because I called you. Nothing I could have done in my life could have made me worthy for God to call me. And I can just echo Paul once again where he was on his way murdering Christians and God called him. And his life turned 180 into the other direction. He was not worthy. It's God's grace and God's calling that made him worthy. And it's the same for you and it's the same for me. That where we are now, we might not feel worthy. But it's not about you feeling worthy. It's about the one calling you. Because if, if, if you were the one wor worthy to receive the gift, what does that mean? Does it mean that you grew to a place where God said, okay, now you are good enough? I mean... Let's think about Samson. I mean, um, if you don't know who Samson, you will read about Samson in the book of Judges. He's the guy with the long hair. He was not allowed to cut his hair. He was a Nazarene, um, set out for the liberation of Israel against their enemy, the um, so Philistines. And then God said that my strength will be on this guy as long as he doesn't cut his hair, does this and does that. But then he used that gift that he got and he gave and he became a bit he gambled with it he used the gift to gamble and all of but the old um so testament doesn't always um so teach us what we should do it sometimes shows us what we should not do but then he messed up he got um so cut and in his final moments he said it's not me it's you god and he liberated israel from the philistines that's grace did he deserve it no is it all about God? Yes, it is all about God. And our lives should be all about God. Because of who we are? No, because of the Lord's favor. And I want to preface that when we go into the rest of it, because there's some principles that we can take from the sermon and apply it to our lives. Things we can use and walk with as we are changed by the love of God and what he does in our lives and through our lives. So Jesus, this is right after he went into the wilderness for four. 40 days to fast, he was um, so tempted by the devil to not rely on God. And then he came out and the word about Jesus spread. And it says here, And Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country. And he um, so taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And he um, so, um, so came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his um, so custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up to read. Now, it was not just anyone that was allowed to go into synagogue and read. You had to be trained. So does that mean Jesus was um, so trained? Yes. But, and he opens up the scroll, or and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he rolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. Now, Jesus enters the synagogue. He um, grabs the scroll of Isaiah. He could have read anywhere from Isaiah. Now, Isaiah would be about this thick or maybe a bit smaller. And then you would scroll up and down. It was all one page that was rolled up from both sides. And you rolled 
up the one end and roll down the other end to and it's a page through the book or roll through the book um, and then he got to Isaiah 61 verse 1 to 2 and he reads the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news and to the poor he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover the sight of the blind so, um, so to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor if you know the Old Testament, that will echo something, and we spoke about that um, on Tuesday evening. But let's look at Isaiah 61, verse 1 to 2. What is Jesus reading for the audience? They will have a response, and we'll um, so talk about the response, because Jesus is claiming something. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to uh, to the poor, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, so to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, uh, so to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. If you are sitting here, here, here today, and you are poor in spirit, Jesus came for you. If you are here this morning and you are broken hearted, Jesus came for you. If you are here this morning and you need liberty, you feel captive by situations or circumstances or maybe people or relationships, Jesus came to set you free. If you are bound, Jesus came to open the prison doors and he came to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn. If you are mourning, Jesus is here to comfort you. In your walk with him, he's there to comfort you. But what I want to focus on is the year of the Lord's favor. When you go to Leviticus, uh, so chapter 25, verse 8 to 12, Moses wrote down the law concerning the year of Jubilee. That is the year of the Lord's favor. So what is Jubilee? We're just going to do some light reading into Leviticus. And he just said, You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Interestingly, it was the 49th year when Jesus was reading this in front of the people. It's so powerful. We will get there. Then you shall sound the loud... Um, so trumpet on the seventh day of the seventh month on the day of uh, atonement you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land what did jesus do he sounded the trumpet of the good news throughout all the land i'm prefacing something because we need to get this and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land and to all its inhabitants liberty from what Liberty, freedom from what? That's where it gets so awesome. Because, I mean, Israelite, what did God promise them? Land. What did they lose? Land. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. The fiftieth year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows for itself, nor um, to gather the grapes from the undressed vines, for it is jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the, the produce of the field. But here it becomes a little bit, I just needed to read that just to get you to understand what the year of jubilee is. It is a, it is a Sabbath year where you are not allowed to farm, you are not allowed to do anything, but what makes the year of jubilee different from just the seventh sabbatical year is what it means for your possessions. If your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, and then himself becomes prosperous and finds sufficient means um, so to redeem it, let him um, so calculate the, the years since he sold it and pay back the balance um, to the man to whom he sold it and then return to his property. This is that if you've lost your land and, and you've sold it to someone, but now you want to buy it back, someone can buy it back for you for the same price that you sold it. 
Um, but property was valued a little bit different. It was valued for the produce it will give over a certain amount of years, meaning that if Jubilee is going to happen, if that year of, of, of rest, that seventh year, there will be no harvest. So you cannot calculate the, the harvest past the seventh year because the new owner would, will need to start from beginning on the eighth year. You know what I'm saying? But this is where it gets really. But if he doesn't have sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee, it shall be released and he shall return to his property without needing to buy it back. I mean, can we have the law? <laughs> I can sell things and after some years I can just go back. Um, and if your brother becomes poor beside you and sells himself to you, so that is property, that's your person, you shall not make him serve you as a slave, he shall be with you as a hired worker, and as a sojourner, he shall serve you until the year of Jubilee. So you'll only be a slave for a short while, or not a slave if he's your brother, he will be a hired worker, only for a certain amount of years, and then you'll be free. And then, if it so happened that you that a that an an outsider came to live in Israel and he became prosperous and you sell yourself to him who is not an Israelite, what does it mean? Well, this is what God is saying. If he is not redeemed by these means, that is, if someone else doesn't buy his freedom, then he and his um, um, children with him shall be released in the year of jubilee. For it is to me that the people of Israel are servants. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So what is the year of Jubilee? It's buying, it's, it, is, it is not buying back that it's on you to have received it. It's on God who sets you free. And this law, it's the words of God that God spoke to Moses on the Mount Sinai and said, what they sell, what they lose, I will restore back to them. And God is saying to you this morning, whatever you have lost, God will restore back to you. Whatever you've lost in your calling or in your confidence or through the hardships of life, God will restore back to you. And then back to Jesus, he's saying, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. There's always good news for those who are poor. And it's speaking here about the poor in spirit. Because they will get back what they lost. They will get back the hope that they lost. They will get back whatever it is that they've lost. You will get back what you've lost. Liberty um, so to the captives. What caused you to be captive? God sets you free. If you've lost your sight... God will restore it back to you. If you are oppressed, God will restore it back to you. Because it is the year of the Lord's favor. And that's what I, what I want to tell you this morning. In our walk with God, maybe before we even get to walking with God, where we were living in the, in, in the old life, where we've made compromise this on what we own, and who we are as a person, God is restoring back to you. There was once a, a time when you were innocent in your sin. And God is restoring that back to you. No enemy, no one can take away what is God's to begin with. What is God saying with the law of Jubilee is that you can do whatever you want with the property. It's still mine and you get it back because I'm God and I say so. You can mess up whatever you want. It's still God's plan for you. I'm not saying you can mess up and then everything will go well. There comes a point where you repent and God restores you. But restoration does come. And we call it grace. It's not because we've earned it. It's not because we deserve it. It's because of who He is. And He's the one that says, I am calling you. I am setting you free. But the thing is, when you start walking in your calling, then let me get to that in the next slide. But then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back um, so to the uh, 
Satan uh, and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Why? They understood what he was saying, but then Jesus went one step further, and he says, so today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Wow, what is Jesus saying? That I am here. Isaiah was prophesying about the servant had to come, the Messiah had to come. And Jesus reads that and says, I am here to set you free. I am here to restore back to you what was lost. I am here to heal the brokenhearted and restore the sight to the blind and to heal the sick. To release the oppressed. And if you watch his ministry, that is exactly what he did. He proclaimed the good news. When John the Baptist was in, in prison, about to be headed, he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah or should we look for someone else? Because John in prison, he wanted to know, is Jesus the Messiah or is there someone else? And Jesus doesn't give a yes or no. He says, go tell John what you have seen guess what jesus says he says go tell john just want to go one slide back doesn't want to work with me he says that go tell john that the blind has received the sight the poor have received the good news and he's echoing isaiah 61 back to great awesome there's one slide if someone can press one button right or click or something. I'm going to try and get it back, but I want I don't want to, to miss the next verse. If you can just click the mouse, it should it should go. Yeah, okay, now that's uh, okay. Let's open up our Bibles. It's fine. It's fine. Thanks. Improvising. We will sort out Wi-Fi next week. Not a problem. God is good. He's in control. It gives us a moment to reflect on what has been said. And let us not lose this moment. Matthew 4, verse um, 22, um, 24. And he, and he rolled up the scroll and gave it back um, so to the uh, uh, attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in, in the synagogue were, were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, And so today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were um, so coming from his mouth. And they were like, oh, wow, Jesus is saying this beautiful word. But then someone says, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, doubtless, you will quote said to me, physician, heal yourself. What we have heard you did at um, Capernaum, um, so do here in your home, um, sit down as well. Uh, and he said, um, so truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. The moment you start walking out in the favor that God has on your life, don't be surprised if those around you say, but isn't this Jason? Isn't this Rudy? Isn't this Louis who at school used to do so and so? Because they don't see the grace that God has. They don't see the favor. They just remember who you used to be. They don't see who, what God has done in your life. If Jesus faced this in his own home, hometown, that they, that, that they rejected Jesus in his own hometown, simply because they could familiarize themselves with Jesus, saying, well, isn't this Joseph's son? So the carpenter, we saw him running around here when he was a kid, doing so and so. But now, who is he to come and tell us that he's the Messiah? No, that can't be. When you start to walk in God's favor, silence the voice of the naysayers, because they will come. They will say to you, but... <laughs> 
if you need to be in, if if you are called it to ministry then from a young age like people will have to say oh wow look at him surely god has a plan for his life does it work that way no god calls god empowers god is equips and god sets free and renews and i'm hope i i, I am trusting this is making sense and he said um so truly i say to you no prophet is acceptable in his home um sit down and then he went and he um speaks of elisha's life and healing that have been received some people rejected the healing and then there were no healing except as one person so jesus is saying to them that the miracles are going to happen whether you believe it or not but you are going to miss out when they heard these things all in the synagogue were filled with wrath and they rose up and drove him out of um, so the town and brought him to the um, brow of the hill on which the uh, um, so town was built so they could not throw him down the cliff by passing through their midst he went away they 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 came against jesus they wanted to throw him down a hill for what he was saying but they could not put one and two together because we saw him grow up and now he's this messiah in front of us no it doesn't make sense but what jesus is saying that that which you have lost god is going to restore back to you the innocence the hope the freedom the joy the peace the patience because whatever calling you might have lost god is restoring back to you because god is the one who calls and if his favor is on your life you were walking in light and the fruit of it will follow but some will see it and they will say no 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 don't tell me that you i saw you as a boy um, um to picking your nose and now you're all holy want to lay hands and, and pray forget about them because it's between you and god god is the one that empowers and he equips and he came to set us free it's not just he did everything on the cross but it still has an effect on our lives daily he's setting us free he's making us holy he is gathering us to himself so that we can be more like him and the more we look like him the more others that do not want to look like him there might be some friction but we don't we are not here for them we are here for god we are there to reach them and reach our hands out and say brother you are really missing out the love of God can change you the way it changed me. And believe me, you can see that it changed me. Don't you want to give it? Don't, don't you want to give God an opportunity to come and do the same in your life? That's sharing the gospel. But we need to live in the calling God has for us. And know that whatever has been lost, God can restore. Broken relationships, abuse, God can restore so much. And he does. We've testified about that yesterday so much. There's no relationship where the grace of God cannot intervene. Cannot intervene. Because he says, the year of the Lord's favor is here. Is it just one year? No. It's Jesus did it once for all. Let us pray. Father, thank you that we can be here this morning. And I pray, Father, that your word impacts us and empowers us and sets us free. Because, God, you are the one who chose us. You are the one that restores us, that dignifies us, that gives us our identity, that we can know that you, we are yours. And in you, we belong. In you, we are free. In you, we are restored. And Father, that where there, were, where there are hopes lost, dreams lost, identities lost, I pray, Father, that you will come and restore it in the name of Jesus. Where there's relationships that are broken, I pray, Father, that you restore in the name of Jesus because you are our Redeemer. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, may your love change us. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.